welcome you all tonight. We're so glad that you guys came out to uh, join us as we worship our great and our glorious risen King, Jesus Christ, as we exalt our great and awesome and powerful God in music and in song. And so we've got a couple guests with, uh, with us tonight. Um, we have some members from Shepherd's House Bible Church. And so this is Brian right here in the middle. That's Molly. And then we've got Nathan on the end. And then, uh, and then we've got uh, some of our own players from Desert Hills. So my name is Josh, and that's Sam. And on drums, we've got Ben. And then we've got Jefferson. And we've got another Josh in the back, because you can never have too many Joshes. <laughs> and then, well, yeah, you can clap for them, too. <laughs> And then uh, we'd especially like to welcome a couple of guys that flew out from Nashville actually last night. So this is um, Braden and Brett right here. So like we've been sharing with you guys, they are with a group called Journey Worship Co. And they are based out of the Journey Church in Nashville. And I, know, I think it was Nino's a couple Sunday that made the joke that you know, that your guys' whole shtick is taking journey songs and turning them into worship songs. So, and at this point, I've just bought into the joke. So I just tell everyone they're writing a song about the perseverance of the saints called Don't Stop Believing. So, <laughs> oh man. But they, uh, <laughs> We are, we're happy to have you guys here, and um, we've been ha able to have some great conversations already since they've been here, and it's so important for our worship and our music to be, uh, uh, to be driven by spirit and truth, um, to be grounded in the Word of God, um, and it's important for us, I think, to um, honor and to recognize those artists that are writing music uh, that is in line with Scripture, that have a heart for the Lord. Um, and that have, have a heart for equipping the Lord's people with song and with music. And you guys are doing a fantastic job with that. So we want to thank you guys so much for joining with us. We're going to open it tonight with a quick video. This is an excerpt from a John MacArthur sermon. It was in the early 2000s. It might have been 2001 or 2002. And it, it's going to kind of prepare our hearts for this first song that we're, going to, that we're going to sing, which is based out of Psalm 8. And in this sermon excerpt, John MacArthur takes, um, he uses a ray of light and moving at the speed of light to illustrate the enormity and the immensity of God's creation. And so we'd invite you to uh, watch along with that and then we're going to stand and sing together. Now let's just stop and think about the power of God if he created all of the stellar bodies, all of the stars, by considering a beam of light moving in 186,000 miles a second or 6 trillion miles a year. And let's begin this morning. When your alarm clock went off at 6 a.m., by the time you really got out of bed, let's give you the benefit of the doubt and say 6.08, that light beam was passing the earth and heading out toward the edge of the solar system. As you sat down to your morning coffee at 6.41 a.m., the light beam passed Jupiter. Now, let's look ahead at the end of the week. As you leave work on Friday afternoon, that little beam of light will be leaving our solar system. Now, you don't have to think about that little light again until you go to vote for the president in November of the year 2003. 
And after all this waiting, our beam of light has only reached the nearest star to our sun. Go on to the year 2010, and our little light beam has only 20 stars behind it. And our sun appears as a rather bland, yellowish star disappearing into galactic darkness. It has to travel 32,000 years before it will reach the center of our galaxy. That's at six trillion miles a year. But wait, it still has another 50,000 years to get to the other side of the Milky Way, which is our galaxy. And when it does, it will leave behind about 100 billion stars. Now remember that the Milky Way galaxy is only an average sized galaxy. And that as far as we know, there are at least 50 billion galaxies in the known universe. Now our little light beam has to travel another 80,000 years to reach the Magellanic Clouds, which is the closest galaxy or series of galaxies to our Milky Way. We're now, having left this morning, 160,000 years into the future. And our light beam faces 1.8 million years of empty space before it reaches the edge of the Andromeda galaxy. Looking back from there at the Milky Way, you would see a fuzzy elliptical patch similar to what Andromeda looks like to us on a fall evening. Now, if our little light beam travels a couple more millions of years, it'll encounter really open space. Our little friend will now travel another 20 billion years before it reaches the edge of the known universe that we know about. After over 20 billion years of travel, with about 50 billion galaxies behind it, with about 100 billion stars in those 50 billion galaxies, Psalm 8.3 says, our little light beam has only seen the work of God's fingers. Or as Job put it, behold, these are the fringes of his ways, and how faint a word we hear of him. Let's stand and sing together.
King eternal, immortal, invisible, to the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue to sing. Come on.
This next song we're going to sing is called To Your Glory Alone. Brian and I have been writing this song for quite some time. We were inspired by Philippians 2, where it says that God has bestowed upon Christ the name that is above every name. There is no higher name, there is no greater name than Christ. And in this song, as we sing it, I want us to think about the glory of God in creation, the glory of God in salvation the perfect submission and suffering of Christ in the garden of Gethsemane. We want, when we sing this song, we want to focus on glorifying Jesus. It is all to his glory alone, amen? amen. Let's sing this song together.
be seated. Well, amen. Thank you. That was wonderful. It's great to have some guests with us, some brothers and sisters in the Lord, to uh, join together and praise our great God and to worship him. My name is Rob Bernanski. I'm the teaching pastor here at Desert Hills Bible Church. I want to welcome you. Uh, it's great to have you here tonight on a Friday night. Just a random Friday in April to get together and praise the Lord and uh, lift up his name. Uh, one of the great things about worship is that it wasn't our idea. Worship is God's idea. It is something that God calls us to do. In fact, in John chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus said this, But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. When we gather together to worship God, we can truthfully say, biblically say, that we have come together to seek his face. The psalmist said that, your face, O Lord, I will seek. But before the psalmist said that, he said this, you have commanded me to seek your face. Therefore, O Lord, your face will I seek. And here we see that we do not initiate seeking God. God initiates with us because God is the one seeking people to worship him. And our worship is responsive to the character of God, the nature of God, the command of God, the love of God for us. Jesus says that true worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And that means that when we are responding to God in worship, we can't come any way that we please. Not all worship is acceptable to the Lord. There is a standard. And Jesus defines that standard as spirit and truth. What does it mean to worship in spirit? Well, some people think that means we got to worship God with our emotions. we got to be emotionally engaged. And we should worship God with our emotions. God created us as emotional creatures. We have emotions we can use them for the glory of God or we can use them to violate the will of God. And we should use them in worship. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He doesn't use the word spirit in the Gospel of John ever to mean human emotions. He always uses it to mean one thing and one thing only, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. We are to worship God under the influence and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not in our own strength, not by our own power. And we are to worship God in truth. And that doesn't mean that we're to worship God sincerely. Obviously, we are to worship God sincerely. Romans chapter 12, let love be without hypocrisy. That doesn't just mean love for one another. That means love for God. Our love for God should be sincere. We should worship God with a sincere heart. But when Jesus says to worship in truth, once again, the gospel of John doesn't use the word truth to mean sincere. The Gospel of John uses the word truth to refer to the word of God. Jesus says in John 17, 17, your word is truth. Jesus came, we saw his glory, full of grace and truth. That didn't mean that Jesus was full of sincerity. It meant that he was filled with the word of God. Everything he said was the word of God because he was the word made flesh. That means that we are to worship God in the power of the Holy Spirit in accordance with the truth of his word, under the authority of his word. What his word tells us to do in worship is what we are to do in worship. And what his word forbids us to do in worship, we are not to do in worship. And this type of worship is only possible for somebody who's a Christian. People who are not in Christ cannot worship God in a way that pleases God. All of their worship is an offense to God. We know this because in Jude, that little book, which if you're reading your Bible and your ceiling fan hits it in just the right way, we'll bit, you know, skip right over it, blow past it. We all have our ceiling fans on now. It's over 90 degrees. So. It says this about unbelievers, that they are 
those who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. The unbeliever can't worship God in a way that pleases God because he doesn't have the Holy Spirit or she doesn't have the Holy Spirit. God calls us to worship in the Spirit. You can't worship in the Spirit if you don't have the Holy Spirit. Only a Christian can do that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, speaks of those who will perish and be deceived by Satan and his activity and his false miracles. And it says, and with all the deception of wickedness, for those who perish, why do people perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. People who are unbelievers have rejected the love of the truth. It doesn't mean they don't know the truth. Right? I think it's interesting the way Paul puts it. They've rejected the love of the truth. They might know the truth. They might acknowledge that what the Bible says is true. They might give a verbal profession and give lip service to the word of God, but they're not saved because they have not received the love of the truth. They're devoid of the spirit, so they do not have the love of God. And so when they hear the truth of the word of God, even if intellectually they're put in a corner and they have to recognize that it's true, they don't love it, they don't believe it, and they can't worship God in it because they're devoid of the spirit and they're devoid of truth. Only true Christians can worship God aright. How do you know if you're a true Christian? The key mark of sincere worship, the true mark of being a believer in Jesus Christ can be summed up in one word, obedience. Obedience. Jesus said this in Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say. And the issue here is not that there are Christians who aren't doing what he says. It's that there are false professors who claim allegiance to him as Lord, but they reveal the fact that they're not actually converted because they don't do what he says. They live lives of rebellion against God. And they can gather together in a church building. They can go to a camp or a retreat or a conference. And they can sing songs and raise their hands and cry and be emotional and, and do all the worship things. But what marks whether that was authentic or whether that was demonic is what happens when they leave. Do they do what he says? Do they live lives of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it doesn't do anyone any good to say, Lord, Lord, and then not do what he says. Jesus put it in a more positive way in John 15, when he was alone with his disciples after Judas had left. And he says this, excuse me, John 14, verse 15. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you were here on Sunday, we looked at the end of 1 Corinthians 16, a little sneak peek at what's going to happen several years from now when we get there. And uh, Paul said, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. If you love me, if you are converted, if you are a true worshiper of God, Jesus says, you will Keep my commandments. You don't do it to get saved, but if you are saved, that means you love Christ. And if you love Christ, that means you will obey his commandments. The mark of all authentic worshipers of Jesus Christ is not emotions and feelings when the music plays or when a certain illustration is used in a sermon that tugs at the heartstrings. The test of your worship is your obedience to the word of God. And when you leave here and you ride home with your family, your children, your friends, your roommates, do you live a life of obedience to Christ? If the answer to that question is no, 
then understand that whatever you're experiencing here tonight that you think is worship isn't. Regardless of how you feel, it's an offense to God. Because you're claiming to worship him, but you don't love him. And you don't love him, it's, it's manifest because you don't obey him. If you loved him, you would obey. And the solution to that, if you find yourself sitting there this evening and you think to yourself, uh-oh, I thought I was saved. And I don't think I am. The solution to that is not to say, I better try harder. I better become more obedient so that I can be saved. The solution to that is to recognize your sin before a holy God. To believe what God says in his word. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And to recognize that you cannot save yourself. Probably for people who may be here who aren't saved and didn't realize it. The reality is the reason you're not saved is because you think you can save yourself. And this is just one more manifestation of that problem. You come tonight to please God, to earn God's favor, to win God's approval. You think this is going to make God proud of you and get you into the kingdom of God. But you can't enter the kingdom of God until you recognize that you can't enter the kingdom of God but by Christ alone and what he has done alone. And you despair of all of your efforts, all of your good works, and you cast yourself on the cross, Christ crucified to save you. If you've never done that today, I would encourage you to please come talk to me or Josh or Sam. Afterwards, we would love to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'd love to pray with you, talk to you about what you're going through and what the Spirit of God may be doing in your heart tonight. For those of us who are saved, this is a great reminder that our worship is not validated by our emotional experience. But are we really, truly seeking to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord so that our entire life is one unbroken act of worship? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for your word. Lord, it burdens my heart to think of the thousands, maybe millions of people in churches around this country and around the world who are devoid of the Spirit, who do not love the truth, who say, Lord, Lord, but do not do what you say, who don't love you, and they manifest their lack of love for you through a life of sin. And Father, I pray that if there is anyone like that here this evening, Lord, that you would bring them to Christ, bring them to the end of themselves. May they recognize that they have no hope in themselves. Their only hope is a merciful and gracious Savior who died on a cross for sinners and rose from the dead. Father, we pray that you would be pleased to save tonight. And Father, I pray that for those of us who are following you, I pray that we would give thanks and rejoice knowing that you've given us your spirit. You've given us your truth. You have sought us out. You have called us to be your worshipers because of your great love for us. Lord, help us as we end our time this evening singing, help us to worship you in the strength of your spirit and according to the truth of your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for that, Pastor. Um, you know, I'm so thankful to be here. I'm Brett. I'm a worship pastor at a church just outside of Nashville, as Josh was saying. And uh, it's so encouraging to be out here among other believers who are like-minded, who are giving up your Friday night. Um, I don't know what you compete with out here. You're not foreign. You're not like aliens to us. Like, you look normal. Um, <laughs> but... I don't know what you what you compete with out here. Um, I know for us, it's like baseball season and other things happening within like high school sports and other things. Um, but this is just this has been so encouraging. It's it's been such a joy to be with you. Um, I, I believe in the local church. I believe that the local church is the hope of the world when Jesus is the center. And uh, I believe that every life would be better if Jesus were the center. 
And uh, so everywhere that we go, we just want to share Jesus uh, with people. And um, this next song, it's not out. You're not going to know it. You're not going to hurt my feelings because some of you didn't know we existed. Uh, and that's okay. Um, but uh, this song came from Psalm 124. And uh, I was reading it one night. I'll read it for you. Uh, I was by myself. My wife was at a women's Bible study, and all of my boys were asleep upstairs. I have four kids, all boys, all under the age of seven. So pray for me. But pray for my wife. Um, hopefully they're asleep. If they're not asleep right now, it's 10 o'clock there. She's miserable. So pray that they're asleep and that she is as well. Um, Psalm 124 says this. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel say now, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We've escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. I read that and I just started thinking, man, isn't that every believer's story? If it, if it had not been for the Lord, where would you be? Think about your own story. The Psalm, I think it's Psalm 98 says, praise the Lord for he's done a marvelous thing. So what has he done? He's worked salvation for his arm or with his arm. So because he worked salvation for his people, praise the Lord. So think about it. Where would you be were it not for the Lord? I thought about that and for whatever reason, I got a little bit of a squirrel brain I started thinking about death, it's very morbid, but I started thinking, man, what, what could I give my boys when I die and when I'm dying that would let them know that dad's okay and you can be okay too if you believe this. And this is the song that came out. So this is where it not for the Lord. Um, as you catch on to it, sing it with me. Were it not for the Lord, I 
and worship and we now have a chance to fellowship together there's food and drinks out on the patio so as you go please spend time encouraging one another in the Lord and until the Lord brings us together on Sunday hope you have a blessed night thanks for coming Yeah.